toward the end of the judge's tenure. At the Shiloh Tabernacle, the elderly Eli had delegated priestly duties to his sons, Hopni and Phineas, who would prove unworthy. Their heinous sins, followed by no genuine rebuke or discipline from Eli, would result in severe punishment for Israel. Eli's sons were evil men who did not respect the Lord or the priest's share of the people's sacrifices. 1 Samuel chapter 2, verses 12-17 through 17. Eli's sons, Hopni and Phinehas, were good-for-nothing priests. They had no faith in the Lord. Now this was how the priests dealt with the people who were offering sacrifices. While the meat was boiling, the priest's servant would come with a three-pronged fork in his hand. Then he would stick it into the pot, kettle, cauldron, or pan. Whatever the fork brought up from the pot belonged to the priest. This is what the priests did in Shiloh to all the people of Israel who came there to sacrifice. But in the case of Eli's sons, even before the people burned the fat, their servants would come and say to the man who was sacrificing, Give the meat to the priest to roast. He doesn't want boiled meat from you. He wants it raw. If the man said to the servant, First let the fat be burned, then take as much as you want, the servant would say to him, Give it to me now, or I'll take it by force. The sin of Eli's sons was a serious matter to the Lord because these men were treating the offerings made to the Lord with contempt. However, there was a boy in the temple who was the stark contrast of these boys. His name was Samuel. Samuel's mother, Hannah, had been childless because God had kept her from conceiving. Her husband, Elkanah, tried his best to comfort her, however. Because childlessness was widely regarded as a blight from God in ancient Israel, Hannah was subjected to cruel mockery year after year. Hannah finally had enough of the heartache and went to the tabernacle to pray. She poured out her heart to God in anguish, deeply hurt. She vowed that if God gave her a son, she would dedicate him to God for the rest of his life. Hannah offered to raise him in accordance with the Nazarite vow, which included abstinence from alcohol and untrimmed hair as signs of a person's dedication to God by promising that his hair would never be cut. This is the same vow taken by Samson. Eli mistakenly assumed Hannah was drunk while watching her intense prayer. When Hannah explained her situation, Eli consoled her with a blessing, which Hannah gratefully accepted. Hannah had reason to rejoice at the birth of Samuel. Hannah cared for her baby for three years, but she never forgot her vow to bring Samuel back to the tabernacle and live there permanently to serve the Lord. She knew it was time to take little Samuel to Eli when he no longer required nourishment from her. When Hannah arrived, she reminded Eli of her narrative and promise and entrusted Samuel to the care of the elderly priest. Hannah returned home, but Samuel remained at Shiloh to serve the Lord. Although Samuel couldn't have known it at the time, he had joined the Lord's army at a difficult time. Shiloh's situation was dreadful, and it was only a matter of time before it became disastrous. 1 Samuel chapter 2, verses 18-21 through 21. But Samuel was ministering before the Lord, a boy wearing a linen ephod. Each year his mother made him a little robe and took it to him when she went up with her husband to offer the annual sacrifice. Eli would bless Elkanah and his wife, saying, May the Lord give you children by this woman to take the place of the one she prayed for and gave to the Lord. Then they would go home, and the Lord was gracious to Hannah. She gave birth to three sons and two daughters. Meanwhile, the boy Samuel grew up in the presence of the Lord. The contrast between a young boy faithfully serving the Lord and two grown men acting as wicked priests could not be greater. And, as if their heinous actions in the tabernacle weren't bad enough, Hopni and Phineas added adultery with the women who served in the tabernacle to their list of sins. Eli, on the other hand, did nothing but scold his boys. No, my son, the news I'm hearing from the Lord's people is not good, he said. In other words, Eli said, now you boys, stop that, as if a half-hearted reprimand would get them back on track. However, he never appears to have attempted to restrain or remove them from service. God's patience with Hopni and Phineas eventually ran out. Because they refused to repent, the Lord planned to punish them for their sin. Samuel, on the other hand, grew in stature and popularity among the people and the Lord. God sealed Eli and his family's fate through the prophecy of a God-fearing man who delivered the message. 1 Samuel chapter 2, verses 27 through 36. Now a man of God came to Eli and said to him, This is what the Lord says. Did I not clearly reveal myself to your ancestors' family when they were in Egypt under Pharaoh? I chose your ancestor out of all the tribes of Israel to be my priest, 
to go up to my altar, to burn incense, and to wear an ephod in my presence. I also gave your ancestors' family all the food offerings presented by the Israelites. Why do you scorn my sacrifice and offering that I prescribe for my dwelling? Why do you honor your sons more than me by fattening yourselves on the choice parts of every offering made by my people Israel? Therefore the Lord, the God of Israel, declares, I promised that members of your family would minister before me forever. But now the Lord declares, Far be it from me. Those who honor me I will honor, but those who despise me will be disdained. The time is coming when I will cut short your strength and the strength of your priestly house so that no one in it will reach old age and you will see distress in my dwelling. Although good will be done to Israel, no one in your family line will ever reach old age. Every one of you that I do not cut off from serving at my altar, I will spare only to destroy your sight and sap your strength, and all your descendants will die in the prime of life. And what happens to your two sons, Hopni and Phinehas, will be assigned to you. They will both die on the same day. I will raise up for myself a faithful priest, who will do according to what is in my heart and mind. I will firmly establish his priestly house, and they will minister before my anointed one always. Then everyone left in your family will come and bow down before him for a piece of silver and a loaf of bread and plead, appoint me to some priestly office so I can have food to eat. It is critical not to gloss over the fact that God did not reveal himself much in those days and prophetic visions were uncommon. It's not surprising, given Eli and his meaningless sons in charge of Israel's house of worship and ministry. 1 Samuel chapter 3, verses 1-17 through 17. The boy Samuel ministered before the Lord under Eli. In those days the word of the Lord was rare. There were not many visions. One night Eli, whose eyes were becoming so weak that he could barely see, was lying down in his usual place. The lamp of God had not yet gone out, and Samuel was lying down in the house of the Lord, where the ark of God was. Then the Lord called Samuel. Samuel answered, Here I am. And he ran to Eli and said, Here I am, you called me. But Eli said, I did not call, go back and lie down. So he went and lay down. Again the Lord called, Samuel. And Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, you called me. My son, Eli said, I did not call, go back and lie down. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord. The word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. A third time the Lord called Samuel, and Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, you called me. Then Eli realized that the Lord was calling the boy. So Eli told Samuel, Go and lie down, and if he calls you, say, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. The Lord came and stood there, calling as at the other times, Samuel, Samuel. Then Samuel said, Speak, for your servant is listening. And the Lord said to Samuel, See, I am about to do something in Israel that will make the ears of everyone who hears about it tingle. At that time I will carry out against Eli everything I spoke against his family, from beginning to end. For I told him that I would judge his family forever because of the sin he knew about. His sons blasphemed God, and he failed to restrain them. Therefore I swore to the house of Eli, The guilt of Eli's house will never be atoned for by sacrifice or offering. Samuel lay down until morning and then opened the doors of the house of the Lord. He was afraid to tell Eli the vision, but Eli called him and said, Samuel, my son. Samuel answered, Here I am. What was it he said to you? Eli asked. Do not hide it from me. May God deal with you, be it ever so severely, if you hide from me anything he told you. So Samuel told him everything, hiding nothing from him. Then Eli said, He is the Lord. Let him do what is good in his eyes. Samuel's reluctance to tell Eli about the vision is understandable, but Eli insisted on doing it anyway. And when he heard this terrible prophecy, Eli had no choice but to submit to God's will. Samuel's life and ministry, on the other hand, were just getting started. As God fulfilled everything Samuel prophesied, he grew in spiritual power. 1 Samuel chapter 3, verses 19-21 through 21. The Lord was with Samuel as he grew up, and he let none of Samuel's words fall to the ground. And all Israel from Dan to Beersheba recognized that Samuel was attested as a prophet of the Lord. The Lord continued to appear at Shiloh, and there he revealed himself to Samuel through his word. 1 Samuel chapter 4, verses 1-3 through 3. And Samuel's word came to all Israel. Now the Israelites went out to fight against the Philistines. 
The Israelites camped at Ebenezer and the Philistines at Apek. The Philistines deployed their forces to meet Israel, and as the battle spread, Israel was defeated by the Philistines, who killed about 4,000 of them on the battlefield. When the soldiers returned to camp, the elders of Israel asked, Why did the Lord bring defeat on us today before the Philistines? Let us bring the Ark of the Lord's Covenant from Shiloh so that he may go out with us and save us from the hand of our enemies. The judgment for Eli and his family did not end at their front door. Because Eli was a leader in Israel, the entire nation suffered as a result of his actions. This is a spiritual principle that appears throughout the Old Testament. Furthermore, the entire story of 1 Samuel 1 through 7 exemplifies the kingdom principle that when one aspect of God's kingdom structure fails to meet his standards, the entire kingdom suffers. Everything is interconnected. Eli's dramatic failure of kingdom responsibility in the family had far-reaching spiritual ramifications. Because Eli was both Israel's spiritual leader and his family's leader, the consequences were disastrous. When the time came for God to execute his judgment on the house of Eli, he chose a familiar path, war with the Philistines. These powerful people lived on the Mediterranean Sea's eastern shore and had been Israel's adversaries since the days of the judges. In fact, they would continue to annoy Israel years later, leading a young shepherd to confront a giant Philistine with a sling and some rocks. God would use the Philistines as a tool of judgment against Israel during Eli's time. The Israelites were humiliated, and it's clear that they had not anticipated this defeat at the hands of the Lord. It's unlikely that Eli publicized the prophecy against his family. According to the reaction of Israel's elders, Eli and his son's poor spiritual leadership had infiltrated the people's attitudes. Instead of looking to God to find out why Israel had been routed, they simply decided to bring the Ark of the Lord's Covenant from Shiloh. In other words, they regarded it as a good luck charm that would protect them and ensure their victory. They confused the symbol of God's presence and blessing with His true presence and blessing. 1 Samuel chapter 4, verses 4-6 through 6. So the people sent men to Shiloh, and they brought back the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord Almighty, who is enthroned between the cherubim. And Eli's two sons, Hopni and Phinehas, were there with the Ark of the Covenant of God. When the Ark of the Lord's Covenant came into the camp, all Israel raised such a great shout that the ground shook. Hearing the uproar, the Philistines asked, What's all this shouting in the Hebrew camp? Bringing the ark from Shiloh meant that it would be carried to the battleground by none other than Hopni and Phinehas. These wicked priests probably thought they were going as heroes to bring Israel victory as they set out with the ark in tow. Instead, they were going to their own funerals. The Israelites, on the other hand, were so elated to see the symbol of the Lord's covenant and glory arrive in their midst that their raucous shout shook the earth. 1 Samuel chapter 4, verses 6 through 11. Hearing the uproar, the Philistines asked, What's all this shouting in the Hebrew camp? When they learned that the ark of the Lord had come into the camp, the Philistines were afraid. A god has come into the camp, they said. Oh no, nothing like this has happened before. We're doomed. Who will deliver us from the hand of these mighty gods? They are the gods who struck the Egyptians with all kinds of plagues in the wilderness. Be strong, Philistines. Be men, or you will be subject to the Hebrews as they have been to you. Be men and fight. So the Philistines fought, and the Israelites were defeated, and every man fled to his tent. The slaughter was very great. Israel lost 30,000 foot soldiers. The Ark of God was captured, and Eli's two sons, Hopni and Phinehas, died. The Philistines were well versed in their adversary's history, having witnessed the plagues associated with the Israelites' exodus from Egypt. They assumed they were in serious trouble when they discovered the Ark, God's throne, had entered the camp. Israel's God had come to fight for them. Instead of fleeing in terror, the Philistine army banded together and slaughtered the Israelites, including Eli's sons. Worse, the Philistines had taken the ark. Understand that this was not just a humiliating military defeat for Israel. It was God's judgment at work. 1 Samuel chapter 4, verses 12 through 18. That same day, a Benjamite ran from the battle line and went to Shiloh with his clothes torn and dust on his head. When he arrived, there was Eli sitting on his chair by the side of the road, watching, because his heart feared for the ark of God. When the man entered the town and told what had happened, the whole town sent up a cry. Eli heard the outcry and asked, What is the meaning of this uproar? The man hurried over to Eli, who was 98 years old and whose eyes had failed so that he could not see. He told Eli, 
I have just come from the battle line. I fled from it this very day. Eli asked, What happened, my son? The man who brought the news replied, Israel fled before the Philistines, and the army has suffered heavy losses. Also, your two sons, Hopni and Phinehas, are dead, and the Ark of God has been captured. When he mentioned the Ark of God, Eli fell backward off his chair by the side of the gate. His neck was broken, and he died, for he was an old man and he was heavy. He had led Israel forty years. This was the day of judgment for Eli and his family. The disregard of his sons to the things of God affected not just the family, but the entirety of Israel. Another man that took the vow was Samson. To watch the story of Samson, click here.